I've spent the last 10 years exploring the connections between the myths and the stars, and the overwhelming evidence that all the world's ancient myths are using a system of celestial metaphor, a common worldwide system, a worldwide language, a metaphorical language, which is based on the heavenly cycles, the heavenly cycles that we see delineated by the motions of the sun, the moon, the visible planets, and perhaps most of all, the stars and their constellations. What is myth? There are many different theories or assertions about what these ancient myths are, these ancient traditions or sacred stories that have been handed down within virtually every culture on every continent around the world and all the islands. There are some people who believe that myth is literal history. So let's put up some of the different uh, theories or arguments. Actual terrestrial literal history. There are people who take the stories in the Bible as literal history. The crossing of the Red Sea or the stories in the Gospel narratives. Actual literal history. And then there's a subset of that of people who believe that the myths are a form of history that's been turned into myth. That these figures such as Gilgamesh or the kings in the Hebrew scriptures, the so-called Old Testament, or the Norse gods, were actually historical human figures that have been euhemerized. Uh, this is, there was a Greek philosopher in the 300s BC named Euhemerus or Euhemerus, Euhemerus, and he proposed that all the Greek gods were actually ancient kings who have been turned in the popular imagination or by literary convention or poets into ancient gods. So that's called Euhemerizing the history. So some people believe, no, it's actually literal history, and some people believe, well, it's actually a Euhemerized or a, uh, uh, an embellished form of actual history that turned into the myths that we have today. So that's one, one theory. I'm going to show that all these theories actually are incorrect. <laughs> but first let's see what, let's review the bidding and see what they are. Then there's another um, school of thought that says that the ancient myths are a form of um, misguided science or superstition superstition or attempts to explain the natural world uh, kind of a pre-scientific pre-scientific attempts pre-science attempts to explain the thunder and the volcanoes and the lightning uh, pre-scientific attempts to explain the natural world is just a mistaken form a primitive misunderstanding. It's kind of a patronizing uh, way of looking at the ancient myths as if, oh, those, those ancient people just didn't know, uh, so they had to make something up. Then there's another category which says that the ancient myths are actually part of uh, a form of oppression. It's a way of keeping people in line. It's a way of uh, the kings telling the other people, hey, we are descended from the gods and you are not, so you have to do whatever we say. Uh, it's the opiate, the early form of the opiate of the people. Uh, that's actually a description. Obviously, that reference of the opiate is a reference to Marx, who called religion the opiate of the masses. This is a potential description of religion, but as we'll see, it does not accurately describe the ancient myths. The ancient myths are actually about uplifting and enlightening and empowering people. They're not for oppression. But some people will argue with me. There's people, even today, who fall into each of these 
schools of thought and will argue that myth is one of these three things. But I'm going to show, just briefly, I've provided lots and lots of evidence in books, videos, on my website, and in over a thousand blog posts now, that the myths are actually not literal history. They're not primitive pre-scientific superstition at all. They're extremely sophisticated and beautiful and show a level of spiritual advancement that is far beyond what we have today. And in fact, there's plenty of evidence that the ancient civilizations had some technologies which even today we would find difficult or impossible to replicate or duplicate. And they're not for oppression. But in fact, they are something that is different and better than all of these three options. And that is, they are metaphor, but they are an incredible spiritual metaphor using the stars to teach us profound and vital truths about our journey through this apparently material world that we find ourselves in, in this incarnate life. Because it's not only material, or it's not merely material. It's infused at every point with an invisible realm, with a realm of pure potentiality, to use some of the language of theoretical physics, uh, theoretical physicists in the quantum physics era who have discovered, you're right, this isn't a completely material realm and we can't describe it with classical physics. It is incredibly sophisticated, incredibly enlightened, the vision of the cosmos that we find in the ancient myths. And it is trying to explain it to us in terms, this invisible realm, this realm of pure potential, the realm of the gods, where anything is possible. It's trying to explain that to us in ways that we can understand, trying to explain the invisible realm to us using visible and understandable metaphors, but explaining something that otherwise we would be unable to grasp. And as Alvin Boyd Kuhn once explained, you can't get to that level of understanding just by starting with the supposedly primitive metaphors. You had to already understand what you were trying to do before you came up with that system. It's like in The Karate Kid, Alvin Boyd Kuhn uh, lived from 1885, I think, to 1963. So he was before The Karate Kid. But to use a metaphor from The Karate Kid, Mr. Miyagi already knew karate before he said, hmm, how can I explain this to Daniel-san? He already had to have a very deep and profound understanding of the martial art that he wanted to impart before he could say, I know, I'll use wax the car. I know, I'll use the metaphor of paint the fence or wax the car or all these different metaphors that he used. He didn't just start with the metaphor and then uh, come up with this system of karate. And, and Alvin Boyd Kuhn would say, this system had to have been designed by someone who already understood these profound, sophisticated, subtle, incredible, superhuman truths before they put it into, or before it was given to us in this form, like Mr. Miyagi teaching Daniel-san, something that he couldn't understand, that his mind couldn't even grasp without the metaphor to help him along. And he actually learned it he learned the motions before he even realized what he was learning, before he learned the meaning of it. And that, I believe it was Aristotle who said, that's the definition, that's a definition of the esoteric or the esoteric. It's where you learn the outward form before you even understand the inner meaning. The exoteric is the outer form. The esoteric is the inner. The, it's hidden, but Mr. Miyagi wasn't using wax the car to hide karate from Daniel-san. He was using it to teach karate to Daniel-san in that movie, the, the Karate Kid. The esoteric is not intended to keep it hidden from us. It's intended to 
give it to us in the only way that we can grasp it. If Daniel-san, if Mr. Miyagi had tried to teach karate to Daniel-san just by explaining it to him rationally, Daniel-san's mind would have choked on it. He would have said, wait a minute, how, what if I put my arm like this? Or are you telling me that will really stop a kick? His, his, his doubting mind would have gotten in the way. But instead, Mr. Miyagi used an esoteric teaching method where he bypassed the uh, part of our mind that is good for other things, but is not necessarily good for learning these more profound concepts. He went past, you might call it the left brain, using an esoteric method. So you will see these myths cannot just be literal history because they're based on the stars. And they are using the infinite realm of the heavens to teach us, to help us to visualize, to help us to grasp, like Daniel-san grasping these abstract concepts that Mr. Miyagi was trying to impart. They're using the infinite realm and turning it into things that we can understand or pictures we can understand so that we can grasp the infinite. So it's actually extremely profound. It's not pre-scientific gropings at what causes thunder. And it is not for oppression. It's actually for uplift, as I've asserted. So let's see some evidence. I'm going to use some examples that I've used before, but I'll try and elucidate some aspects that maybe you haven't heard, even if you've been following for quite some time. But the stories around the world are using very clear celestial metaphor. And this is sometimes called the, the concept of astrotheology. Sometimes people call it astrotheology, and that's a, a concept or a term that's gotten a lot of use and a lot of popularity lately. But unfortunately, it usually, when somebody is explaining it, they don't go very far with this uh, idea, or they don't really understand how specific and how deep it really gets, theology, astrotheology. They'll talk about, oh, well, you know that the Jesus story is based on the sun and the motions of the sun. And there are aspects of the motions of the sun in there, but really, as I endeavor to show in my books about the star myths, these stories get even more specific than that. This is often taught in kind of a general, a hazy way, and it doesn't really help us to see the profound truths that these stories are getting at. You could um, listen to some of these assertions that, oh, you know, that these stories are based on the motions of the sun, and say, oh yeah, well then it must just be uh, pre-scientific, primitive uh, discussions about, you know, the seasons, uh, what causes this seasons, you know, those people had to know when to plant their crops, so, uh, this shallow astrotheology, I sometimes call it, can actually be worse than um, worse than taking them literally, because you lose. It can cause you to actually lose the sense of wonder and the profound message that they are uh, conveying. You can actually get to those profound messages if you take these ancient stories literally. It's unfortunately, as I showed in my most recent previous video to this one, taking the stories literally can lead to inverting the message and coming up with all kinds of racist and colonialist and imperialist and oppressive uh, domination of other people messages, which is wrong. But taking them literally can help you to see some of the profound messages. And there's people who today take it literally who would reject the racist uh, interpretations that have been put forth in previous centuries or the oppressive the use of it for oppression and colonialism, but would still take it literally and can find great truth and beauty there. But the stories are not actually intended to be taken literally. And uh, if, if they'd never been used for oppression and trying to falsely excuse or condone racism or conquest or taking away the lands of other people, then you might say, well, why even show that they're not literal? But because that literal interpretation or misinterpretation has been used and continues to be used, 
to try to falsely excuse or falsely justify, not really justify, but falsely justify taking away the land of others or oppressing others or even waging war on others, we have to understand that they are not based on historical ancient history, which I'll endeavor to show. So let's start with a, a pattern that is found around the world. I want to show how specifically, how specific these myths are. When they're talking about these episodes, they can actually be shown to tie to specific constellations. And I would like to start with the story of the judgment, so-called judgment of Solomon, where two women come to Solomon, one, uh, one baby has died, one baby is still alive, and Solomon has to figure out to whom this baby belongs. So let's read from 1 Kings chapter 3, in, beginning in verse uh, 16. This is right after the vision where Solomon has been given wisdom. He asks for wisdom from the Almighty. And Solomon awoke, and then in verse 16, 1 Kings 3, 16, Then came there two women that were harlots under the king and stood before him. And the one woman said, O oh my Lord, I and this woman dwell in one house, and I was delivered of a child with her in the house. And it came to pass the third day after that I was delivered, that this woman was delivered also, and we were together. There was no stranger with us in the house, save we two in the house. And this woman's child died in the night, because she overlaid it. And she arose at midnight, and took my son from beside me, while thine handmaid slept, and laid it in her bosom, and laid her dead child in my bosom. And when I rose in the morning to give my child suck, behold, it was dead. But when I had considered it in the morning, behold, it was not my son which I did bear. And the other woman said, Nay, but the living is my son, and the dead is thy son. And this said, No, but the dead is thy son, and the living is my son. Thus they spake before the king. Then said the king, This one saith, This is my son that liveth, and thy son is the dead. And the other saith, Nay, but thy son is the dead, and my son is the living. And the king said, Bring me a sword. And they brought a sword before the king. And the king said, obviously speaking to someone else, at first, when I was a kid, I thought the, the king used the sword, but he's obviously talking to someone else here. First he says, Bring me a sword. Then he says, Divide the living child in two, and give half to the one and half to the other. Then spake the woman whose the living child was under the king, for her bowels yearned upon her son. And she said, O oh my Lord, give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. But the other said, Let it be neither mine nor thine, but divide it. Which actually doesn't make sense, because originally she was trying to get the son. So we can already see it's probably not a literal story, unless the other woman just became overwhelmed and psychologically she didn't want anyone to have the son. But at first she was trying to get that son to be hers. That's what she was saying a minute ago to the king. Then the king answered and said, Give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. She is the mother thereof. Obviously referring to the child, uh, the mother who said, Don't slay the child. Now, very interesting, this story can be seen in the heavens. And the most interesting thing about it is this pattern of the stars that play the role of the child, first of all, they're not obvious. And second of all, they are found playing that role in other myths around the world that would supposedly or seemingly have no contact with the ancient biblical uh, text. So if this is a literal story, it shows up in different ways around the world. So first, let me lay out, and I've done this in other writings. I've written about it in uh, my book, Star Myths of the Bible. I've done some videos about this story, but there is very clear indication that in this story, the living baby is actually associated with the constellation Corona Borealis. Corona Borealis, the northern crown, which is this beautiful, dazzling circlet of stars that shows up in some myths as a beautiful necklace. One of the brightest stars is here. It's called Corona Borealis. And it shows up in myths as a necklace, which makes sense. You might 
extract that a, a circlet of stars that looks like this in the heavens, people could independently come up with that as a, uh, a necklace in different cultures. But to see that as a baby is a little bit obscure, and yet that's exactly what we find around the world. And in fact, this baby, babies do actually arch vigorously. If you've ever had a baby and had to change its diaper or something, and, or it's really angry at you, it, babies will arch when they're just furious. And this circlet of stars is held up by another constellation, the constellation Hercules. The constellation Hercules is what we call that constellation. It doesn't mean that that constellation always plays the mythical figure we know of as Hercules or in Greek myth Heracles. Some people will get confused about that. That constellation always or often plays a very strong figure, not always a male figure, sometimes a female figure, but often plays a very powerful, vigorous figure, just like the constellation Hercules, I mean the myth, mythical Hercules, but that constellation will also play other figures, and in this story, the constellation is the swordsman, and you can see that Hercules, the constellation, has this big sword arched over his back, as if he's about to cut that baby that he's holding in two, and like I said, this little arc of stars is the baby, and you can see that in Renaissance art down through the centuries, this baby uh, that the swordsman in the Solomon scene is holding, often the swordsman is holding the sword over his back, just like the constellation Hercules, and the baby is always depicted arcing vigorously, because the convention was apparently passed down, whether the artists understood it or not, the convention that this baby is associated with this crown, this northern crown, appears in the artwork. And that figure, that convention, is found in other myths around the world. One of the most uh, startling places that we find it, in terms of a place that would seem to have no connection with the biblical texts, is in the myths of the vast Pacific. In New Zealand and the islands of the Pacific, all the way across to Hawaii, there are the stories of Maui, and it covers a vast different distance across the uh, Pacific Ocean. It's, in fact, the largest body of myths in terms of geographical dispersion. It's the largest geographical dispersion of any body of myth. And Maui is one of the central figures, and he's thrown into the ocean or into the sea foam by his parents when he's born um, because they're horrified. In, in one instance, he has eight heads. They throw him into the sea foam, and he's uh, surrounded by jellyfish that, that protect him, keep him warm so he doesn't die. But then his great ancestor, Tama, sees these flies and, and birds picking at something in the sea foam, and he goes down to investigate, and it's a baby. It's actually one of his descendants. It's Maui. It's baby Maui. So Tama snatches the baby up, and Tama, the powerful Tama, is again the constellation Hercules snatching up this baby, and Tama takes baby Maui and hangs him up in the rafters uh, nearby the fire so that he can warm up and dry off. So he hangs him in the rafters, which is uh, seems like a rough way to treat an infant, a newborn, but that's because the Milky Way band goes right past Hercules, and not far from where uh, the northern crown is, is up in the rafters near the roof of the sky, near the, where the whole northern celestial hemisphere appears to turn around. For those of us in the northern hemisphere, we see the north star up there. That's near, the northern crown is, is a pretty far northern constellation, and that's why baby Maui is suspended in the rafters by his powerful ancestor, Tama. So, here we see a connection between a myth in the Pacific and a sacred story, a myth in the Old Testament, in the book of 1 Kings. And New Zealand wasn't even, quote, discovered or known by European cultures until the 1600s. So, that would argue that these two cultures are basing, these two stories are descended from the same celestial source, the same 
ancient source that probably informs both of them because I would argue they probably didn't just stumble across this pattern on their own independently and say, hmm, that looks like a baby. Because that's actually not the first thing you would think that that looks like. And in fact, the outline of the constellation Hercules is a little difficult to pick out in the night sky unless you know what to look for. So it would be unusual for two different cultures to necessarily see Hercules as the same powerful figure with a sword holding, reaching out to grab the northern crown. And yet we find it in these different cultures separated by vast distances and using it in very similar ways as holding up a baby that's arching. Um, and yet again, we find it in other myths from around the world. For instance, uh, in the story of Achilles in Greek myth. Achilles uh, is held up by his heel when he's an infant to be dipped into the fire or into the river Styx to be made immortal. He's held up by his heel, and that's why uh, he's grasped by his divine mother, Thetis, holds him up by his heel, puts him in the fire, and that little part didn't get uh, immortalized, whether she dipped him in the river Styx or in the uh, fire, the, the mystical, magical fire that's going to make him immortal, because Thetis is a goddess, but um, her husband is a, is a mortal, so... Achilles is going to be mortal, but she wants to make him immortal, so she dips him in the fire or in the river. Once again, that fire or river is the Milky Way, and the baby that's arching is Achilles. And in those myths, the baby Achilles is snatched out of the fire by his uh, father, who doesn't know what's going on in, in some aspects, some versions of the myth. It's interesting that the Achilles myth, there's different versions, and the ancient Greeks didn't seem to have a problem with that. Sometimes they dip them in the fire, sometimes they dip them in the water. They understand that it's not literal history. If so, there might have been wars between the two factions. Oh no, I'm an Achilles dipped in the fire faction. Oh, that's heresy, he was dipped in the water. They didn't have any problem with that because they weren't taking it literally. They understood that it was a metaphor of our spiritual condition. We are like Achilles. We have a divine aspect, but we're also mortal. Uh, so this same pattern of the, the, the failed baptism in Achilles has to do with this same part of the sky. And then there's another part of the Bible, uh, this time in the New Testament scriptures, in the scriptures of Revelation, in chapter 12, where there's an infant that's snatched up. This is an infant who is snatched up right after it's born, just like in the Maui story. Remember in the Maui story, uh, in some versions, he's thrown, in, he's thrown away by his parents because he has eight heads, where there's a dragon in chapter 12 uh, that stands before a woman who's about to deliver a child. It's a, a great dragon having seven heads, in this case, seven heads. It's a constellation Scorpio, which can be seen crouching beneath the constellation Virgo, I've talked about this in another video as well. Virgo looks like she's about to give birth. And below Virgo crouches this constellation Scorpio. So in the Maui myth, the constellation Scorpio with its multiple heads is baby Maui. And he's thrown into the sea foam. That's the Milky Way. Then his grandfather or his ancestor Tama pulls him out. In the New Testament story, it's, the baby is not Scorpio. Scorpio is this dragon that's going to devour the baby here in uh, Revelation 12, verse 4. The dragon stood before the woman, ready to de uh, the woman which was ready to be delivered, in order to devour her child as soon as it was born. And the woman, in verse 5 we learn, and she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. The child caught up to God in his throne. That, the, that same constellation Hercules I've shown in other myths actually plays the role of the Almighty. I, I show that time and time again in the book Star Myths of the Bible, which is Star Myths of the World, Volume 3. So here we've seen multiple versions of this story, this same story, very specific story. Notice this isn't just, oh, it's kind of like the sun and going through the seasons. This is specific constellations that show up, same stars show up in different stories. Sometimes it's baby 
Achilles, sometimes it's baby Maui, sometimes it's the living baby in the story of Solomon. So what does this mean? Well, it actually has tremendous ramifications, more than I have time that would be uh, to, to put into one video. It's outside the scope. In fact, the, the, the ramifications are profound and far-reaching. For one thing, they pretty much explode our conventional understanding of ancient history because it appears that all these ancient stories are connected in some way that is not admitted, it's not explained by conventional history. Either someone was sailing around and um, crossing oceans and giving these stories to other cultures, which I don't think is what happened because they show so many differences, or they're all descended from some even earlier common source, which I think is much more likely. We have these types of stories showing up even in the uh, ancient Egypt, ancient Mesopotamia, ancient China. So it goes way back before even the earliest civilizations that are known to conventional history. In fact, there's a failed baptism. I talk about this in my 2017 book, Astrotheology for Life. There's another failed baptism motif in the story of Osiris and Isis when she goes looking for her husband Osiris. When Isis is looking for Osiris, she tries to make a baby immortal by putting it in the fire. Um, so these are very ancient patterns. I believe they show the existence of some much more ancient and spiritually sophisticated and also scientifically sophisticated civilization because it, this ancient civilization understood these profound spiritual truths that are encoded in these precious myths that, that survived in all the different cultures of the world. And also, there are some sophisticated astronomical concepts, such as precession, encoded into these myths as well. So, I believe they show the existence of a now forgotten or previously unknown civilization. So, the myths are a form of evidence that goes along with all the other archaeological evidence around the world of something going on in ancient history that's beyond what our conventional timeline will admit, our, our conventional academic uh, vision of ancient history is pretty much overturned by this evidence. It's also pretty clear that these stories are not literal history because if they're literal history, if you want to say that the story of Solomon is literal history, then does that mean that the story of Maui is just a copy of a literal event that happened in the reign of Solomon? Or is the story in the Solomon text a copy of a literal event that happened to someone named Maui? You see what I'm saying? They can't all be, or it would be very unlikely that these are all literal history, and they all just, and Achilles, and they all just happen to literally ha uh, take place in the same way around the world and in different centuries. They're not literal history. They're based on the stars, and they can be clearly seen to be based on the stars. But they're not there as primitive pre-scientific attempts to explain science. And they're not there to hold us down. They're not an opiate to, to oppress us. They're actually there for spiritual uplifting and enlightenment. And I talk about this in my explanation, my discussion of the Solomon story, for instance, in Starments of the Bible, Volume 3. In that story, there's a dead child and a live child. And they're born three days apart. Three days being a spiritual uh, a point. Uh, it's, a, it's a spiritual indicator that we're talking about spiritual things. It shows up in a lot of myths and sacred stories around the world. Also, three months also shows up, as I discussed. But the the, the stars and the myths, they're using this language of the motions of the stars through the heavens to talk about profound spiritual aspects of the life that we're living and the cosmos that we inhabit. And they use this code where the upper half of the year between the spring equinox and the fall equinox, here's the two equinoxes, the two crossing points, on this half of the year, days are longer than nights. This is the upper half of the year. Down here, nights are longer than days. And the longest day of the year, 
we get to at the summer solstice, which is the June solstice for the northern hemisphere. And the shortest day of the year we get to at the winter solstice, which is the December solstice in the northern hemisphere. This upper half, you might think that represents our life in this body. You would think, oh, day is life and night is death, but actually it's the opposite. Uh, a lot of this is discussed. Alvin Boyd Kuhn helped, helped me to understand these, uh, this code. This lower half is what we're going through right now. And when we're born into this lower half, this is actually in the sign of Virgo right here. The, the constellations can point us to specific parts of this code. That's why it's so much more subtle than what you usually hear. It's so much more um, full than what you usually hear when somebody's talking about astrotheology. The sign of Virgo is where we descend down into the lower half of the year in the heavens or in the heavenly cycles. It's also where we have our first birth into this physical body, this mortal body. This body's going to die. That's the dead baby. We have the one mother is kind of cursing. She's angry. She's representing us coming down into this, um, this physical body. But we have a second birth. Three months later, not three days later, but in the story it's three days later. Three months later, after that first birth, we get to the point of turning where we come back upwards. This is where we start ascending. See, the lower, the lower half of the year represents our spiritual uh, a plunge down. Our spirit is plunged down into matter, and our spirit kind of forgets where it came from, and we forget our connection to this invisible world, and we even deny this invisible world and say, oh yeah, it's all material. Some people, uh, some people continue to deny that there's anything spiritual, but there's this turning point where we realize, wait a minute, I'm not just a physical body. I'm more than that. That's the second birth. That's the living baby in this story, the second mother. We have both of those aspects going on inside of us. We act like both of these mothers. Sometimes we act like the mother who is going crazy and says, yeah, kill, kill him, I don't care. That, she's lost it. Um, that's, showing our, our, uh, that's showing how depraved we can become when we just think about our physical, if physical is all that we live for, if we're just living for dominating other people like dogs, dog eat dog, uh, as uh, one of the epistles in the New Testament says, don't just be biting and devouring one another. But we're supposed to realize, wait a minute, every single person that we ever meet and we ourselves has, we ourselves and everyone we meet has a spiritual component, a divine component, an infinite component, an immortal component that's not going to die like our physical bodies are. That's the living baby in this particular story. There's, this is, this is, uh, there's metaphor after metaphor in the ancient myths to impress this truth of, upon us. These stories are all about our experience and, and this incredible incarnate life, this journey that we're taking through this apparently material, but actually material and spiritual universe, this uh, finite and infinite fused together cosmos that we're going through. And that's what these ancient myths are talking about. And so I hope that this discussion shows that myth is something more than what we're usually taught. It is something so much more. It's so profound. It's so beautiful. And it is based on these esoteric metaphors that point us towards profound truths. And they operate on many levels. It's kind of like uh, the martial arts. You can keep going down deeper and deeper and never reach the bottom in Kung Fu or Karate or Tai Chi. Uh, to go back to the Mr. Miyagi metaphor, he was trying to impart something very special and precious to Daniel-san. And he had to use uh, a special way of, of getting Daniel-san to start to see, to open Daniel-san's eyes. Well, these myths are so profound, they're infinite in their depth. You can keep going down deeper and deeper and never reach the bottom. I was saying that for a long time before I even realized that Alvin Boyd Kuhn says that also in his, in his writings. Uh, he encountered the same truth. You can keep going down and never reach the bottom. They are so profound, but we have to listen to them in the language or it's 
much better to get their message if you listen to them in the language that they're actually speaking. And it's not a literal language, it's a celestial language.